microphone there. Not going to talk about um, uh, uh, turbidity curtain and all that's kind of not really diverting the water flow. Uh, so anyway, that's that's kind of the limits here uh, between sheet pile and the and the turbidity curtain. So, oh, sorry, I've, I skipped the video just for time. Uh, so when you're looking at diversion, we do two kinds of projects usually. Um, one being uh, that we divert part of the river or part of the creek, and then the other where we block the creek off. So in the upper right, so this was like an intake for a water treatment plant, and they put a, a steel frames and a liner around uh, to divert the river over to one side. Um, and then we have completely blocking it off on the bottom. Those two pictures really uh, fit together, uh, but they um, so they've made a dam, blocked up the entire creek, and then running it through that culvert. Uh, to the other side of the project so we can work all the way through the bottom of the, of the creek bed. So, you know, that's a big consideration. Uh, if we're just pushing it over, oftentimes we don't do a lot of checking on the flow, um, those kind of things when we're putting it into a culvert or trying to pump it around a project, you know, it's really, really critical that we understand how much water is going to be flowing in that, in that water body. Um, just some types of stuff that we work on and, and I think are pretty normal. Uh, uh, steel frames with a liner, uh, large, using large sandbags or small sandbags, uh, usually with a liner as well, and uh, kind of an odd one uh, using like a steel plate or something like that to down up the water. We've also used concrete blocks, like uh, ecology blocks we call them, or concrete barriers, like a uh, Jersey barrier type uh, concrete. Um, obviously with a liner as well, uh, boulders, uh, some clean rock, or uh, water-filled dams. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about water-filled dams, just I don't have a lot of experience in that. Um, most projects I work on, they're, um, they're just not, uh, people I work for aren't very interested in that. I don't know why, uh, but uh, that's just the way it has been. Uh, so things that we look for is uh, what's the depth of the water, uh, how much flow is in the stream, uh, is it consistent? Like, is it a stream that's going to flood uh, during certain times of the year and then be really benign? Around uh, Boise area, we have a lot of streams that flow really low in the wintertime, and then when the irrigation season is on uh, in, the, in the summer, then they flow more because they take irrigation wastewater. And, uh, and so we'll have, uh, it's, it, you have to really understand where, what kind of water body you're working in and when the flows can be higher or less. Um, then we have permitting we have to follow. And then what kind of, what's in the bottom of the, the stream, if we're gonna do a small dam system, what, do, what are we gonna be dealing with? And then, um, and then the access and cost, obviously, so. Um, the height of the water, uh, you, you go out and look at it and say, oh, this is how deep it is. Uh, I put these pictures in here. This was a dam that we got to work on and it was uh, when we started at the beginning of the day, then you could walk across it with uh, just mud boots on, no problem. And uh, at the end of the day, by moving this water over so that the, you can see the road in the background, I hope that, um, that has the, uh, uh, they're trying to repair the riprap that's holding that road together. Uh, so we had to divert the water over. But at the end of the day, uh, where it was uh, knee deep at the beginning, it was, it was armpit deep. And so, you know, understanding what's gonna happen when the, the river's plugged up and, and trying to predict that is, is really important. So you have the right material there. So. Um, oops, I skipped a slide, sorry. Uh, why does the depth matter? Well, one of the biggest things that we've had dams like just not work out very well is uh, that we're choosing the right kind of liner, what, what kind of plastic or whatever we're gonna use. So the steel frames, I'll, I'll start from the bottom and go up. The steel frames um, have uh, usually a reinforced poly. So there's string reinforcements in there, some polyester uh, strings in there to make them super tough. And so those usually come in like a 30 or 45 mil. And uh, it's really essential for that kind of a dam. You know, anything that you have above about three feet, you need to start looking at, well, do I need a reinforced liner? <coughs> We've had success uh, up to four feet or so, five feet even, which is liner. So the picture on the bottom left uh, has some PVC that's lining those, those uh, big sandbags. So it's like a 30 mil PVC it will withstand a lot of, of pressure as well. Um, we've seen a lot of failures uh, working with contractors where it's like, hey, this dam isn't working, it's leaking, and where it's just plastic sheeting. Once you get over a couple of feet, it's really easy 
for the hydrostatic pressure to split sheeting of, you know, even 10 mil um, uh, reinforced six mil and stuff, it starts getting holes in it just from the pressure of the water. So, so plastic sheeting can be used just the cheap stuff, uh, but you gotta really pay attention to how much water you're gonna like going to dam in the, in the stream. So really, really essential to, to understand what's going on and how, how much pressure there's going to be. Uh, it'll be different too if you have water really, um, say, intersecting your dam at 90 degrees and then put more pressure on the dam. You know, that might be a consideration as well, rather than just kind of like pushing it to one side. So let's talk a little bit about that with uh, sizing of pumps and culverts and, and, uh, and things. Um, this is a picture like, Often when we're working on bridges and uh, say culvert replacements, uh, three-sided box culverts and those kind of things that are smaller, we'll have a hydraulics report. And uh, this is just a page from one, uh, uh, usually the Department of Transportation or the agency that's prepared the bid documents. So they have done this to size the culvert and then we, we obtain those documents and uh, use those um, to, uh, to understand when, okay, we're gonna be in the water like say February and so on this chart, you see February. And so there's a different percentage, the February D20 and the D50 and the D80. Those are um, uh, the percent chance during that month that you're going to exceed that flow. So uh, there's a 20% chance that we would exceed 27.6 cubic feet per second in February on this stream. And uh, so really uh, that's a Department of Transportation thing. They usually have us using the D20 uh, to be safe. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, 27 CFS is a huge amount of water, uh, obviously. So if we're going to try to pump around that, uh, maybe we ought to try to finish this project before January, right? So the flow will be lower. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's a lot of the way that we go about getting this information. I've done it on smaller uh, canals and, and smaller creeks uh, where you say, yeah, we're going to be in here for three weeks. We need to size the culvert and use a stream gauge and measure the cross section of the stream, just got it. What is it flowing right now? It's probably gonna be the same in three weeks because it's in August or whatever. And we uh, do it that way where we just figure it out ourselves, but we're trying to plan ahead for several months of diversion. This is, this is the best way. Um, so the pumping capacity, I work with a lot of contractors that say, hey, we're gonna pump this water around our job site. Once we realize how much flow it really is, they're not, uh, the, I guess I include these pictures because there's some really massive pumping power on this project uh, to divert this stream around uh, around a project, and uh, and so a lot of times so I'll go in work start to work on something. I'm a consultant, and they say, "Hey, we want to divert this. Can you help us with the plans? We got to submit." And we'll start working on it and say, "Like, okay, this is how many gallons a minute you're going to need to pump." And then it's like, "Okay, can we just use a culvert and we gravity it through because that's cheaper?" But but anyway, just, just wanted to point that out. A lot of times um, the perception of what's actually flowing and, and how much it really takes to pump that quantity of water, um, it looks like less in a stream uh, to a normal person than, than what's actually required to pump. That's it's really, really common and a common theme that, I, that we deal with all the time. So sizing culverts, uh, this is a project where the stream's being diverted in that culvert and they're removing sections of a bridge and replacing them. You know, you need to know what, um, what the grade is from the start to finish of the culvert. So a few times we've had to go out and measure that in the field. Uh, sometimes it's, it's shown enough on the plans. You have to know the type of pipe that the water is going to flow through because different pipes have different roughness and then the diameter. And then you can calculate what the maximum capacity of that pipe is. Is it big enough? Do we need two 12 inch pipes or could we do 124? Or could you, you know, so. Another thing that uh, just like rule of thumb, you know, uh, two, two 12s don't equal a 24. 24 can handle like three times the amount of water. Uh, well, and when I work with contractors, a lot of time we, we discuss that. So, uh, so anyway, there's something to watch out for. Um, uh, a few times, uh, so if you're diverting a larger river, uh, with a say a coffer dam on one side and then building an abutment or a pier and then putting a coffer dam on the other side. Um, the only real way to know what's going to happen to that water as you start diverting it and stuff is with a river rise analysis. And I gotta be honest, I've only done this um, uh, once in the last 10 years. 
uh, for a project uh, where the specification said that it had to be one dam at a time. And the contractor said, well, we need to have two dams in there. And so they uh, did this. Um, and I, I don't do the river rise analysis, to be honest with you. I, I haven't got into that. I have too many other things I, I have learned and try to do, like shoring and temporary um, temporary retaining walls and stuff like that. So I've kind of left that to a consultant that I hire. Uh, but anyway, you can see that the, the horizontal line is um, in this uh, image is, is the bottom of the bridge. And so then uh, purple is no dams, red is one dam on, on the east side and the green is on the west side. And if we put them both in is the, is the dark blue line. And, and so you can get up to say almost 9,000 CFS before things go haywire. And, uh, and so we planned the months that they could have two dams in the river and then make sure that one of those is out of there before, before it floods and, and overtops the dam because that would uh, cause some problems, obviously. So um, uh, the other things to think about too is like the direction of the flow, like I said earlier, and then are there gonna be any kind of debris in the river? Um, uh, this is a photograph of a, a dam that we helped a contractor with and they, they put it in uh, to, in order to do a bunch of bank stabilization. You can see the bank barb that's on the on the left side of the image, and it has a where the eddies have scoured out the bank, and they're they're working on a development for this property and, and uh, going to stabilize the bank. And so the dam worked really good at first. It's you can tell it's it's a very shallow. Um, the guy's standing in there. It's uh, ankle deep water in there. They're just trying to make it so they can work and the turbidity won't mix with the clean water in this very, very clear river. And, uh, but anyway, it froze, it was really cold within uh, three, four days of putting this in. Looks nice to the, in that photo, but it got really cold and ice was flowing down the river and sliced that plastic all up. And so, so you know, that's something to think about, uh, you know, what, what flows down this river. Uh, we worked on other projects where there's uh, people float for recreation in the Boise River and the Payette River are uh, either rafts for whitewater rafting or uh, just recreational tubing on the lower parts of the river. And so you're putting a big dam out there. Who's going to, who's going to be floating by and how do you, how do you control river traffic and those kind of things too, like maybe a more robust liner system would have been appropriate. So, so anyway, don't forget that uh, so it can cause problems. So speaking of that, this is a project where there was uh, the, the main channel, the river was where the sheet pile is, um, really um, a deeper and a heavy flow. And so they decided that the, the regular steel frame dam with the liner that you can see in the background wasn't gonna be adequate where it's, where it's taking the full brunt of that flow. And so this contractor, they drove sheet pile in, um, uh, along the one side that's going to take the brunt of the flow and then put the, the liner style dam on the other side where the flow wasn't directly into it. So yeah, it's a really uh, uh, good thing to think about um, that it's not going to, uh, to cause a problem because on this project too, later the, the river got so high because just up against schedules to get the dam out that the water started overtopping the the liner part of the dam and it, it sure would have caused a lot of damage you know, on the full brunt of the flow. So um, now a little bit about, uh, you know, the consistency and flooding, uh, like in this image is a outlet of a diversion. And as you can tell that that's just flowing like a few, maybe 40 gallons a minute or something like that. It's very low flow, but this stream uh, during the winter time can take up to 100 cubic feet per second. So, so really the timing of when the dam goes in has a lot to do with the success and maybe a lot more to do with the success than a lot of other things. As a, can you put it in in the low flow and get out of there? That's, uh, uh, that's the nature. Maybe it's not that way all, the, all around the country, but here uh, in Idaho and I know a lot of the West, that's, that's a big deal. The flow changes well, wildly. So, um, I'm going to show you some photographs of uh, example. This is a project with a dam on both sides. The contractors working uh, uh, building the uh, piers in the in the riverbed, and then the river's diverted between this. It's almost it's almost continuously lined through the middle of there, and so it worked great. Right. Uh, this is on the Boise River. The flows in the summertime are around a thousand cfs. Um, 
pretty low, you can uh, you can do a lot of things. And so um, next next picture is the same taken from relatively the same place. You can see that they removed the dam on the on the one side, the near side of the of the bridge, but the dam's on the on the far side. And then you see in April, so a week later, they removed both dams. But the water still seems pretty consistent. That water down there is getting pretty useless. And uh, I'll uh, I'll divert your attention to the bank on the other side. If you look on the on the upper right of that first image, there you can see the bank with the trees on top of it. Now you can see the bank with the trees on top of it. Pay attention to the the bottom of the of the piers where the architectural the bottom of the architectural uh, part of those abutments there or piers. And uh, now you can see. Like it, it was just a week later, um, the, the bank on the opposite side of the river is gone. The water's right up at the at the base of that pier. Um, that those dams would have been just destroyed by this uh, flooding here just a few weeks before. So, so anyway, that's uh, that's probably the like the biggest thing on the contractor putting those dams in and pulling them out on time and things. And you know how much time does it take to get them out removed? Uh, what what to do uh, as a contingency plan is is a big deal. So now to talk a little bit about permitting and submittals and uh, monitoring requirements a little bit, but uh, just really, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're used to submitting. So somebody who maybe hasn't done this a lot, kind of have an outline of uh, of what kind of things we we're often submitting. So. I'm an engineer, a professional engineer, and so that's that's a big reason why I started doing this. I work for an erosion control company, and I um, and so the, when, when the state of Idaho or the, the Idaho Transportation Department started requiring stamps on on uh, these kind of plans, uh, I was already there doing the SWIP, and I kind of just did a lot of them and still do. So so this is an example. This is a uh, 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 Army Corps of Engineers, the drawings that we would be looking at to start the project. Uh, you can see there's a um, temporary coffer dam shown. This is what was submitted to the Army Corps by the Transportation Department. I didn't prepare these, um, but there's it identifies wetlands and everything that shows where the dam is going to be. And they provided a, a cross section and it says temporary coffer dam material to be determined by contractor. Example piles or sandbags. So um, so they just drew an image and said, hey, the contractor is going to build something here. Um, sometimes it's not this way. Like you really got to be careful. Uh, sometimes it tells you exactly what kind of dam you're going to use. Uh, sometimes it says that this must be a sheet pile wall. Uh, sometimes uh, it gives a certain amount of uh, space that can be occupied by the dam and, and things. This one's really uh, vague and was pretty easy to, to design. But, but anyway, those are the kind of things to look for is what 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 does the permit actually say is going to happen with the diversion? Like how is it going to happen? We've seen some that um, that just say, hey, there'll be a, a silt curtain here, you know. So then we're not actually diverting the river. We're just going to put in a silt curtain and try to keep the turbidity separate. And uh, but that more and more we're seeing, at least here in Idaho, which we're in the Walla Walla Army Corps district, um, they uh, would uh, they're they have these diversions and stuff where it's a, it's a really a separation of the whole whole site. So you can see where the riprap is going to be dug down uh, almost uh, six feet deep. And so, yeah, there's, there's a big excavation. You couldn't do that with a turbidity curtain. You, you really need to be able to dewater and get to the bottom to place the riprap correctly. So, so this is what it looked like in the end when the contractor built it. So if you go going back two slides that the dam on the, Right hand side, the big long one. This is what the contractor did. Um, they stacked the bags, and the, I, I took these pictures because uh, I was there on this side. On the other side of the river, they did first, and uh, you can't see the abutment in this picture. But there's an abutment on the other side that's shorter, and it was probably like a quarter of the size of this for length. And they were pumping, gosh, a, just a ton of water. And they said, "Hey, we, I don't know, this dam doesn't work very good. We're pumping all this water." So I went out there and looked at it with them. And uh, the plastic liner was all bunched up against the bottom of the bags. And uh, they really tried to just kind of float it out there and hook sandbags on it to get it to go down to the bottom. And we had a discussion about how that's not going to cut it. And, uh, and I went out when they were building this one 
and uh, you can't see the guys in the water now because it's all in place but they um they were uh they had five or six people out in the water they had a telehandler putting sandbags out there for them they used like per foot like four times the amount of sandbags to weight down the liner in the water and everything and uh, them with some kind of tips and stuff and so this this side was four times as long but pumped probably a quarter of the water uh, because they really took their time and, and spent some effort getting the liner on the bottom of the river placed correctly which is usually what does it if that if that plastic can really seal up good on the bottom that's why it'll work that's why it's good but it, I also point out that you can see a little uh, trench in the back of those sandbags and then in the picture on the right you see some pumps and hoses and so there, there's always some seepage and so part of the design is is how to handle that seepage uh, what, what's going to happen with the seepage water can you keep that separate from getting full of turbidity and things like that so almost all these dams the one with the metal frames anything with a liner there's the seepage and and then you would uh you need to divert that somewhere to a sump where it can be kept clean so so here's so typically a uh, submittal from us. Uh, there's a written narrative, there's location maps, there's detailed drawings, shop drawings. We usually have some calculations. And it just depends on the, how the seriousness of the diversion. Uh, sometimes the calculations are just um, a settling pond for the dewatering part of it, pumping the water out. And uh, sometimes they're, uh, they're actually, we include calculations about the flow, how much water we expect to come through the dam and uh and how our pumping power inside of our dams is going to be sufficient um uh so then we have almost always a settling basin calculation for water we pump out of the inside of the dam and then sometimes we have to do calculations for the structure even like kind of like a gravity wall uh design for these that the, like say the bags won't tip over or the steel frames are are uh, wide enough at the base that they won't tip over and stuff like that so it just depends on where the frames are coming from. Some proprietary uh, things are very good in their specs. They have that. Sometimes I've had to do those calcs. So, so anyway, that's normally what's in there. Uh, we usually have something documentation about how we got the flow of the stream and why the culvert's big enough, that kind of thing. Um, if we're diverting through a pipe, say, or uh, we usually have to have turbidity monitoring reports like the one on the right. We'll include, like, hey, this is how we're going to track and, and log our our discharges and uh, then um, if they're not like a proprietary system like a dam system then we're, we're providing specifications like this is the type of liner we're going to use this is the type of bags we're going to use something like that so um, this is an example shop drawing from a abutment project you can see the upper left detail this shows how deep the riprap's going the location of some sumps to pump water out from inside the dam shows a, a bulk bag. This, this is very shallow water next to an abutment, but um, to put the riprap down low, we had to block the water. So you can see that it shows the liner going out into the, the bottom of the river with sandbags on it. And there's some detail, plan view detail. I don't know why this one has a sandbag detail. It's just the one that I found that we did not too long ago. So so anyway, that's that's a normal shop drawing that we submit. Something like that shows how long it's going to be, why it can go up the bank, how it's going to hold the water back. So not too complicated. This is uh, like that type of a dam, uh, doing things for bridge projects for the transportation department. Usually I have to provide something about how much seepage and then say, hey, well, this is the kind of pump that would be used and, and stuff. And this is why our settling basin is big enough to handle the water pump out inside the dam. So I, I just put this in there to explain uh, the importance of having the dam go out in the bottom of the riverbed and the liner being extended out, like the example I talked about a few slides ago. Um, the, the way to calculate the seepage under something like this is um, through this um, diagram or this drawing on the right, where you would, this one's pretty simple, uh, but um, you calculate the, the you, you basically estimate the number of flow paths and then how many equipotential drops. So horizontally you have four drops and then vertically you have four or three flow channels. And so if all I had was the bag there, say it was wrapped in plastic and the, there was no liner going out in the bottom, well then I would have like two equipotential drops. And so the equation is the number of flow channels divided by the number of drops. And so if you get uh, more equipotential drops by extending the liner out in the river, 
well, then mathematically, you're going to have lower flow seeping through uh, uh, based on the hydraulic conductivity of the soil. And so just, uh, I can't stress that enough. I've um, designed a lot of these and then not helped install them and had a contractor say, these are, this doesn't work. And I go look at them and say like, well, you know, on my drawing, I showed the liner going 15 feet out in the river and it's not. And, and uh, you know, it, it is really important that there's a good seal that that liner is stuck to the bottom. That's what makes it successful. Um, uh, I emphasize a lot, like you're going to need 3,000 sandbags at least, you know, and because uh, people don't understand that, like how many, how many sandbags are really required to weight this liner down, make sure that it's all sealed up the best we can. So a lot of handwork involved, a lot of manpower to make it work right. So uh, another thing is outlet protection, where's it discharging? In this case, um, they are discharging on the bank and uh, just wanted to make sure that there was no scour there to, to scour out the bank cause problems. Um, I need to hurry, I'm almost done. So substrate's a big deal. You can see how rocky this one is. This had a lot of problems. You can see the size of the, there's two big pumps pumping water out of the inside of the dam on this project because there's the river bottom was just so full of boulders that the plastic liner didn't really help a lot because the hydraulic conductivity of that material is so high. So that, that's something to look at, you know, if it's really high, really cobbly, bouldery like this, then it's really, really hard to use a liner system and it's hard to drive piles. So no, no good solutions. This one, there's like really limited right away. And so the contractor developed a plate and they just pounded it in with the bucket on the excavator. And, um, and so that, you know, that's a big consideration. Do you have space to put this dam in and, um, like the next picture, you can see the liner is really kind of stuck uh, where there's willows. I right? can't put it too far in the willows because the liner won't seal down on the willows. And, uh, and so it's kind of like we're kind of limited in how much we can do there. But um, there's a video here, but I'm, I'm about out of time. So I will uh, I'll go to questions. Um, I think we have few enough people that if you guys want to unmute and ask questions, I'm going to start off with one. Um, how, what do you do about fish in the river? Yeah, um, good question. I there's um, some pro. It depends. A lot of it depends on the specifications and the environmental requirements for that specific river. So I'll, I'm going to back up close slides. So in this picture, in this video, then this was all. The, this area below the dam wasn't particularly dewatered very well, but the dam had more to do with diverting the water to prevent the turbidity. And there's a biologist and they came in and sained the fish out to keep them on the other side of the dam after it was put in. So right when they were finishing putting the dam in, they ran sains through the river down there and got the fish out. A lot of times when we're pumping, we're required to put fish greens uh, either around the pump or upstream of our uh, dams and then uh, keep the fish out that way. Um, some of the projects we've had to go in at a certain season because they say the fish spawn after this date. And then we've gone in a, by a certain date and put fish screen in around where the dam was gonna be installed. And then they, they don't spawn because they can't get through our fish screen and we can build the dam inside of the fish screen or fish fence, I guess. So, so those are the things that I've experienced. And it's all really depending on the ESAs that are um, that are part of the project, really. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have uh, questions? Okay, oh, well, I think that ends the presentation. Um, I would encourage everybody to, um, well, we'd like to know about the timing, 30 minute presentation, the um, 1215 to 1245 timeframe, also future topics for presentation, presentations. Oh, I thought I had allowed everybody to unmute here. I'm sorry, let me, let's see here. Sorry about that. Uh, I can't figure that one out. Why don't you go ahead and type in your question if you don't mind, Mike.
Actually, I figured it out. Why don't you try to unmute? Any tips on getting the liner seal at the bottom? Yeah, so hi, this is Mike from uh, Oregon City. Um, yeah, do you have any tips that you've used successfully in the past on deploying liners and getting them to seal on the bottom? I guess, uh, yeah, I guess here, my experience has been one, like in that, in the picture that's on the screen now or that I had up last, that there's lots of boulders and stuff like that. And so if it depends on the permitting and the, on the, if you're allowed to, but shoving boulders out of the way really works good. Um, uh, putting the liner down, um, like it has a lot to do with the crew that's actually working on it. And so having the right amount of manpower is really um, critical, especially in high flows. So like uh, if the water's not very uh, still, like getting it out to the right spot and then setting it down and getting the sandbags on quickly is really the best thing I can tell you. You uh, really encourage uh, putting solid touching sandbags all around the outside perimeter of the liner and uh and then putting some in the field seams putting solid sandbags across the seam and things like that so when you start to remove water from inside the dam then the water pressure will help suck it down to the bottom but if you have bad seams and and the bad out outside then it'll the water has a tendency to keep coming inside the the dam so that's, that's where we've seen a lot of problems is like, oh, this dam is really leaky. And then we go out and, you know, hand move rocks and get the, get it on the bottom and get a continuous layer of sandbags that are really tight, stepped on, pounded in there really good. That's, that's really my, my tips for you is to get the, get your seams really, really nice and tight and, and lots and lots and lots of sandbags. Okay. So. Have you ever used the uh, cigarette roll method for the, for the liner? Yeah, where it's rolled up and then you, yeah, you sink it and then un, and then unroll it on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's not that's not a um, bad way to do it if you got the. It, it all depends on what kind of manpower and what kind of uh, um, uh, flow and stuff like that. What what'll work the best? Yeah. Okay. It, when I was showing that video clip, then it was. Um, uh, it really, it didn't work very well just because of the velocity of the water. Like it was really hard to control. And mm -hmm. so we had a hard time like unrolling it because of the velocity of the water. So we just did it all at once, put it in and sunk it. So, but the, the cigarette roll method is actually like pretty much your only option. If you're doing the metal frames, it's really hard to do anything with metal frames. You don't have a solid backing against the dam and it's like so starting it and then rolling it out a piece you know a little at a time to cover the frames is really the only thing you can do because you got to attach it to the frames at the same time that you're doing all that yeah thank you yeah yeah hopefully that's helpful thanks mike uh, any other questions i'm going to keep adam on as long as it takes so if, if we have questions to 130 adam i hope you don't have other plans no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I was, uh, I was assuming that I, uh, in this, in this video too, I was going to point out that they're putting the downstream liner in second, and that's not preferred. Uh, you know, you'd want to go downstream and up if you can. It'd be a lot easier. Uh, but because we had to dam it up to get the excavator across the river the excavator couldn't work across the river without damming it up from the uphill side down. And so it was a real nightmare, like to try to pull the liner back and get a liner underneath the other one. So normally you would want to put the downhill liner, get it secured and put one on top of that and put one on top of that like shingles. So. Uh, that looks like it's that standard six mil visqueen, isn't it? Black visqueen? It's 30 mil PVC in the video. Oh, it is. Okay, great. Yeah. 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 No, that's a high enough flow. I wouldn't, it wouldn't, the six mil would have ripped or yanking on it. I had, I was on this job mostly to, uh, to meet with all the people about the permits because there was a tribe and federal highways and, oh, a biologist or two and all these people and the Forest Service and uh, they, 
the contractor said, can you come out just so that you can talk to them about the permit and then and we can keep working. And then after a few hours, the permit people didn't need me anymore. And so I jumped in the water and helped them. It was really fun. Hey, Adam, this is uh, Clint. How are you doing today? Good. How are you, Clint? I'm doing well. Uh, quick question for you that I have, and I've, I've had to deal with a few of these diversions in my past too, and not as successful as what you've done. Um, but uh, quick question, do you have to sometimes develop contingency plans for high flows? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, quite often. So, so yeah, the contingency plan... I guess I could tell you about a few of them that I've done and a few of them that have had to use them. Uh, usually the contingency plan, it just depends on the type of dam. Um, you know, if it's a if it's a bulk bag type dam like this, like one layer high, the contingency plan is let it go, right? Overflow, go into like through our project. But if your project has disturbed soil and stuff, like I had one project where it was gonna go up over the dam, we knew it was gonna happen. And um and so the contractor went in and put uh, geotextile down over all the disturbed stuff on the other side of the dam, sandbagged it all in, it flowed over the dam, it receded, they started pumping again and went back in a few days later. It was a pretty small operation. For a larger dam, um, you know, your contingency plan is going to be a huge mess, whatever, whatever happens. So, well, Thank you for that, man. Uh, but usually it's like, what can you stabilize, right? What can you stabilize if it's going to overflow? And then, uh, and could you add pumps, you know? So. Correct. Yeah. One project I'm working on right now, uh, we have a stream diversion that we're dealing with. Uh, but the only caveat with it is it all goes into a siphon uh, that diverts under a road and then comes out on the other side. And the situation is it's designed for a two year, uh, for 25 year uh, storm event. And uh, in Western Washington, you know how significant that really is because you can get that in about a matter of a couple hours and then it's gonna yeah. elevate where we had to do an overflow channel on ours. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have done a few where we had a, like a, a 48 inch culvert and then there was like a 24 inch culvert off to the side and that was the overflow, but I, I, not very often, yeah. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Clint. Um, anybody else have anything? Well, it looks like lunch is about over. We're slowly losing people here. <laughs> so any any last uh, words of wisdom, Adam, before we close out? No, I think, uh, I guess my words of wisdom are river and creek diversions are super fun, uh, but uh, super risky. You never know what's really going to happen until you get in get in the water. So that's my words of wisdom. Take, take a, a, I guess, be careful of the risk because that's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it never quite goes the way that you think it's going to go. So Cool. Thank you so much. Um, that was a very, very interesting and informative presentation. And just um, remind everybody that this uh, link to the presentation will be posted on the chapter YouTube site, as well as the chapter LinkedIn site. So if you uh, need to go back and listen again, it'll be available. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, Adam, for taking the time out to present. And uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close this one out. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.